Southwest Airlines proving why people really hate traveling by airplane these days. The lack of predictability off the charts. Southwest single-handedly representing 86% of all U.S. airline cancellations. Something's got to give. Hello, welcome to the program, everyone. I am Trish Regan. I hope you are having a wonderful, wonderful holiday week with a little bit of downtime. I really hope you're not flying Southwest. If you are, chances are you are stuck somewhere. Now, granted, we've had some horrific weather, very cold weather. Interesting, you know, given all the uh, climate change stuff people are worried about global cooling, right? Lots and lots of cold weather all around the country, which has led to a horrific travel schedule for Southwest Airlines. I mean, other airlines have been affected too, but nothing like Southwest. Why is it that Southwest is in such a bad situation? Do we need to totally revamp the airlines? I mean, you even got Joe Biden weighing in now saying we're going to hold them accountable because people, their lives get just completely upended when an airline does something like this. And there ought to be a better way to prevent these kinds of things from happening. I mean, hey, the weather was predicted, right? What happened to their algorithms over at Southwest that they weren't able to figure this out? More on that in a moment. But first, portions of today's program are brought to you by Legacy Precious Metals. If you're interested in investing in gold or silver, you should call them right away today or go to their website, LegacyPMInvestments.com. Again, it's LegacyPMInvestments.com. You'll get your free investing guide there. We're going to talk a little bit more about it coming up because gold, what do you know, is over $1,800 an ounce right now. And there's a very specific reason. So we'll get into that in just a moment. But before we do, back to Southwest, back to the airline debacle that we are currently looking at. I just want to point out that the carrier had canceled 2,589 flights as of Tuesday around 2.30 p.m. That's like two-thirds of its schedule. And it's going to continue doing this through Thursday now, it said. It's going to continue those flight cancellations. Southwest might be able to get away with it just a little bit more if it hadn't gone through the exact same thing just last year. I mean, it's already been through this. We've already, we've already seen this movie. And I remember complaining at that time that we really needed to see better algorithms from the airline to anticipate these climatic difficulties. The climate issue is not going to change. And by that, I mean weather. You are always, if you're an airline, going to have to anticipate weather challenges. And you can't just shut down and have to cancel all these flights. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. And and interestingly enough, in this case, you've got Southwest. It's really the outlier. They were sort of the worst of the bunch, if you ask me, last time as well. But you're looking at cancellations that are, say, I don't know, 30 times more that of Spirit Airlines, another low-cost budget carrier. And again, accounting for roughly 86% of overall cancellations for the entire airline industry. As a result, you saw Southwest shares falling about 6% hitting a two-month low, $33 and change, $34 about in the session. And I would think that it's going to continue suffering more difficulties. Can you imagine? All in, it looks like over the holiday weekend, they've had to cancel about 12,000 flights since Friday. It's absolutely insane. And what happens to those passengers? I mean, I remember back in the old days when I would fly when I was, you know, kind of a kid in my teens and early 20s. And this was long before cell phones. This was long. This was back when, you know, you had to carry quarters or dimes for pay phones, probably dimes. You'd go to the airport. You didn't need to go through the whole security rigmarole that, of course, came as we faced increasing threats, understandably. But it was a very different kind of day in travel. And one of the benefits of those days was that when an airline actually canceled your flight, remember when you'd go to the counter and it wouldn't be a crazy long line. You'd just stand in line for a little bit. You'd go to the counter. Somebody generally nice. This is back when the people were like nice when they'd work with you and they'd they'd change your ticket to possibly another airline. It wasn't like you had to just stay within the sphere of that airline and they wouldn't charge you anything. They just wanted to make sure you got to the next location that you needed to be at and the airlines kind of worked together to make sure that that would happen. The other thing is if they couldn't do that, they'd put you up in a hotel and they'd give you a meal voucher and they'd give you a, a toiletry kit and you'd be on your way off to the closest airport hotel. They don't like do any of that anymore. It's kind of like you're on your own, fend for yourself. I had a situation just a couple of years ago which has gotten me really frightened to fly over the holidays because I was with my family of five down in Miami over New Year's trying to make it back for my father's 80th birthday. I was trying to do so on New Year's Day. So difficult time to travel. I get it. I had some tickets booked with my family. It was for a very, very early morning flight because again, I wanted to get back there to New Hampshire. Actually, in this case, we were flying into New York and we were going to drive up to New Hampshire for my father's 80th birthday. Around four o'clock in the morning, 
We're up, packing up the bags, packing up the kids, getting ready to leave for the airport, pulling our suitcases down the hallway in the hotel when we get a text from American Airlines saying, you know what, that flight that you were supposed to be on at 6 a.m. or 6.30, I can't remember, it's been canceled. And instead, guess what? We got you on a flight tomorrow that's going to Washington, D.C. Okay, now, first of all, my flight was booked into New York and not Washington, D.C. And on top of that, I needed to go today on New Year's Day. Good luck, by the way, finding a hotel room in Miami on New Year's Day. Long story short, we wound up ourselves at this point now in the car on the way to the airport, booking a totally different flight out of a different airport on JetBlue, going back into the New York area so that we could get our car and make it to New Hampshire for that birthday party that night, which we did. I'll tell you, I've never been so angry though. Never been so angry. I have never in my entire career used my Twitter account to expose business for something that was of a personal matter. But to me, I felt like, wait a second, okay, I got these seven, 800,000 followers on Twitter. And this is one where I kind of actually need to say something, right? I need as a consumer to speak up because this is so fundamentally wrong. And look, I'm lucky. You know what? I can say, well, with you, American, I'm going to book JetBlue. Yes, it's going to cost me a fortune, but I could do that. Look, most people can't. You make a certain allowance for your trip and you expect that that's what it's going to be. And you shouldn't have to shell out a zillion bucks to just make sure that you're able to stick to your original itinerary. I mean, that really exposes a lot of Americans living on a budget to a lot of vulnerability. And it's absolutely not right. It's funny, I tweeted all this out. Within a few minutes, I actually got a message from someone in the White House, not from the president himself, but nonetheless, someone pretty high up in the food chain who was saying that they had just gone through a very similar experience with the exact same airline. And these are the risks now that we have to take, I guess, when we travel. I went through, again, another problem with an airline, not the exact same airline, but it was a U.S. airline, and I was trying to get overseas to Europe with my family of five and the the plane was badly delayed, which delayed the connecting flight that we were supposed to be on. And it just, it was a just a nightmare and a very expensive nightmare at that. And this is the problem when you can't rely on the system and we can't rely on this system. The system is no longer inclusive in the way that it used to be. Again, with the airlines working to help each other and thus help their customers to make their connecting flights and to get where they need to be on time or at least covering the bill when you can't. I mean, we just cannot depend on travel anymore. And it's made me as an individual very reluctant, certainly to travel with my family. It's one thing when you're on business, But it's hard when you're on a family vacation and you're trying to get three kids and two adults and possibly some grandparents to Timbuktu. If you can't rely on the system, then what good is the system? And so this may be an opportunity for government. And you know, I don't like government getting involved in much of anything. Although I will say Amtrak is pretty decent. This may be a chance for government to to really help influence the situation because look, people need to travel and they need dependable travel. And airlines shouldn't leave you stranded. 12,000 tickets at a time. It's just not right. It's wrong. For my friends who would say, well, let the free market take care of it. Okay, good fine. But again, people need to travel. And so they're going to book these tickets and they don't have enough influence over the the system. Again, I was able to say something on my little Twitter account and actually get noticed by the White House even. And thank you to all of you. By the way, if you're not following me on Twitter, do me that favor at Trish underscore. There's an underscore in there. Regan, you can tell I didn't know what I was doing when I set up the account. But again, it's at Trish underscore Regan and follow me there. But you were so wonderful in terms of helping me to get the word out. And we did. And we did. And American noticed. But that's a one-off. How do we help everyday people? This might be an opportunity for government to come in and say, we expect more from this industry and we're going to stand up for the consumer and make sure that that quote unquote consumer bill of rights. Remember we used to have that? That was something that was a thing. We need a bigger, more robust version of that for all these people that are traveling. And you know what? I'm sorry. Okay. Maybe, maybe they can't give the big discounts on the fares. Maybe they need to protectively build in their own insurance, these airlines. I think people would be willing to pay just a little bit more in order to actually get some kind of guaranteed product. That's That's important. You know who should really take this on if they haven't already? And I I wouldn't be surprised if they've already made some noise on this front. It's Association of Mature American Citizens, AMAC. You've heard me talk about them before. It's just a wonderful group. And they do do a lot within the travel space. You get all kinds of travel discounts if you sign up for them. And it's worth signing up for because it's just 16 bucks a year, 16 bucks. And you get the travel discounts, you get the food discounts, and you get the restaurant, hotel, all that good stuff. So go to amac.us slash Regan. But this is an organization, the Association of Mature American Citizens, that's working 
very hard to get the right policies in Washington, D.C. and all throughout the country to really look out for everyday Americans. I think of it a little bit like a conservative version of the AARP because it really is trying to protect the interests of mature American citizens. And so the organization is extremely helpful in terms of advancing policy ideas in Washington, D.C. throughout the country that will benefit everyday Americans. And it's important given the complexity of all this policy, airline airline issues being one of them, but also all the economic policy that needs to help protect us and our future. So AMAC is a wonderful organization. I encourage you to join them. They're up to two and a half million or so members. And so all of that activity pulled together really starts to make a difference. Go to amac.us slash Regan, R-E-G-A-N, my last name, no relation, unfortunately, to Reagan. It's just R-E-G-A-N, amac.us slash Regan. Sign up today. You will not regret that because you're going to make the money back. It's 16 bucks. You're going to make the money back in in the first week just on all your discounts. Back to the news of the day. Turning from airlines, I want to get to gold right now. You know, of course, that portions of the program are brought to you by Legacy Precious Metals. Legacy PM Investments dot com call one eight six six five eight nine zero five six zero today one eight six six five eight nine zero five six zero I want to be upfront about that before I get into this um, just so that you know one of the sponsors is gold but I'm just delighted to see gold up about a percent right now as I look at the gold continuous contract it's at one thousand eight hundred and twenty one dollars and sixty cents a gain of nearly a percent we're looking at this range really over the last several days where it has been climbing steadily back up above that eighteen hundred dollar price target. And that's that's really good. I mean, in fact, I think if, if you go back just a few months, even back to November, you would have seen it around 1649. And I, I'm kind of like a broken record. I, I am someone who does believe in the long-term benefit of gold in one's portfolio as a diversification tool and not to exclude silver because, you know, legacy PM investments does do a lot with silver as well. But just talking from my own bias and my own perspective, I've often looked at gold as something that really helps to even out those fluctuations in your portfolio. So when things get really scary on the international front, that's when you kind of want gold in there. When things look really scary in terms of the solvency or liquidity or challenges such as we faced, for example, during the threat of March 2020. I mean, everything was going down, but still gold is that one sort of safe haven in those environments. And then the other reality is that when things start to improve, then a lot of people, especially overseas, start buying more gold because they're flush with more cash and thus they want to be in gold. Gold jewelry, for example, very popular in India. Well, anyway, one of the reasons it is believed that gold is on an upswing right now is actually because China has reportedly been piling up its gold. In fact, there's an article from the Chinese Chinese Communist Party sponsored paper South China Morning Post dated December 2nd of this year. So just a few weeks ago, talking about how China has been increasing its gold reserves for the first time since September of 2019 in order to help diversify its holdings, given all the international financial market volatility, the lack of stability we're seeing. And don't forget, of course, oil prices expected, in my view, to continue moving higher. I know that they've been a little bit softer in recent trading, but as we see that oil ban come into effect or that price ban from Russia, which they're pushing back against, you'll see in the news, of course, this week. But as that all happens and you see less and less liquidity in the oil markets, China is out there trying to better hedge its portfolio and so much so that it's actually reportedly bought 1.03 million ounces, lifting its gold holdings to 63.67 million ounces, again, according to to the communist-backed paper South China Morning Post, <clears throat> effectively an arm of the government. So they're saying that China has increased those gold reserves. They're doing so, as I said, for the first time since September of 2019, bringing China's total gold reserves to north of $112 billion. Well, okay, it's still, frankly, I mean, I don't see it as that large a part of their portfolio, given that they're still looking at about $3.3 trillion dollars in official reserve assets, primarily which are held in U.S. dollar assets, right? Because don't forget, they're effectively the banker. They're the ones that are holding a lot of treasuries, a lot of sovereign wealth funds, primarily U.S. What I do consider interesting about this is the increase in the effort to diversify, perhaps away from some of these foreign holdings, like all the things that they're holding in U.S. dollars. Again, let me just be clear, very, very small percentage of their portfolio But what they're realizing is that when the world goes to hell, where do you want to be? You want to be in U.S. dollar-backed assets and 
you want to be in gold because those are the two real safety plays. According to the World Gold Council, central banks added a further net 31 metric tons of gold to international reserves. That would be in the month of October, boosting official reserves to their highest level since November of 1974. Think about that. That's pretty incredible. So again, a lot of governments, sovereign wealth funds all around the world are saying, okay, where do we need to be? Where do we want to be? Well, they need to be in U.S. dollar-backed assets and they need to be in things that aren't U.S. dollar-backed assets. But that's when you start seeing slim pickings, right? They don't want to be necessarily in the cryptos right now, and they don't want to be in debt from countries that aren't as reliable as the U.S. In fact, when you go around the world, and I know Joe Biden keeps saying this, he's like, wait a second, we're the prettiest girl at the dance because we have less inflation than everybody else. Well, the reason for that is because we still control the world's reserve currency being the U.S. dollar. Therefore, we control, you see, inflation all around the world. So while inflation is bad here, it's definitely bad everywhere else. Meaning if you're a sovereign wealth fund anywhere else in the world, if you're China, you're saying, how do I protect my overall portfolio, my assets? Yeah, okay, maybe begrudgingly you're in the U.S. and you want to diversify out of the U.S., you start looking to gold because it's one of those things that typically, and you know, look, nothing's, nothing's totally guaranteed in this world. We all know that. But over thousands of years, gold has really hung on to its value. Not to say that it's going to go to you know, 1500 in a couple of months. But I, I don't see that. Honestly, I think that the world is in a delicate state enough such that you want to have some reassurance and safety in the portfolio. I'm not your financial advisor, but I do recommend that you give my friends over at Legacy Precious Metals a call because they're just good people. And you're welcome to use my name, of course. They can help you figure out whether it's a gold-backed IRA or whether you want the actual physical stuff. They can help you figure out how to do it all. It's it's sometimes a little more complicated than it seems, especially if you actually want it. Then you got to figure out the physical, actual stuff. You got to figure out how to get it to your house. You got to figure out how to get it to your safe deposit box, if that's the case. Also, if the gold-backed IRA is the route that you want to go, that's also something that you need a little bit of planning and a little bit of expertise with. So call them over at one 589 I was going to do the gold story anyway. They actually didn't even have a commercial on today's show, but I wanted to at least bring that to your attention in light of me doing the story. And hey, it's always nice when these asset prices are going up, right? Speaking of asset prices going up, I think it's still questionable now. As we go into the new year and we look at the equity markets, I told you yesterday, and I believe this, that there's an opportunity to be looking at different kinds of assets, including treasuries right now. We haven't been able to do that in forever. And so as tough as things could be economically, I would encourage you to always look at the bright side, right? And part of the bright side is that savers are finally going to be rewarded for saving. Imagine that. You actually can get a return on your money. And if you buy, say, for example, a municipal bond, in the state in which you live and you make a certain amount of money, then you can save on both state and federal income taxes. So it becomes a real win-win if you can find the right muni bond in your state. But hey, look, I love the idea that we get a chance at at getting back to a more normal market environment where if you're going to take on equity risk, Hopefully you're compensated enough for that. But simultaneously, if you are a saver, you're compensated for that because it felt like for the last, what, however many years, I'd really say since President Obama started his term and Bernanke was so anxious, as was Yellen, to get us out of the mess that was the financial crisis of 2008, it's been only sort of one show, right? There was only one game in town and that was the stock market. So finally, we have a more normal balance coming into play. So think about that and use that accordingly as you you try and plan and you try and save because it's not fun <laughs> losing money. I think we would all agree when we work so hard for it, you don't want to lose it. Anyway, before I go, again, a quick shout out to my dog Fluffy and to the wonderful creators of this terrific supplement that I have been giving him that has been so helpful in terms of, well, in my belief, some of the allergies that he struggled with and and, and sort of just overall in giving him the energy to, to continue being almost like a little puppy, right? Like I loved his energy as a puppy and a lot of that energy is coming back and I believe it has a lot to do with diet. Somebody else who believes diet is really the key to everything is Dr. Dennis Black, a naturopathic doctor, a former army ranger, really wonderful guy who passionately believes in we are what we eat. So he believes that in terms of humans. He also believes that in terms of dogs. He's got two beautiful, beautiful dogs himself and he he set out on a quest to make sure that they had the healthiest supplement they could possibly have. So you don't have to change the actual food, but this is sort of the magic sauce that makes that food for your dog so much healthier, so much better. And by the way, so much tastier. It's called Rough Greens. Rough, get it? R-U-F-F Greens, G-R-E-E-N-S. Go to roughgreens.com. Dr. Dennis Black, again, naturopathic doctor who cares passionately about all of our health, including, including our pet's health. 
He came up with this supplement, and he's got a great deal right now where you get a free trial bag, free trial bag. All you have to do is pay for shipping because he wants to make sure that every dog in America this year has their chance at a really healthy life, a healthy lifestyle. I know Fluffy loves it. I know your dog will too. So go to roughgreens.com today and get your free trial offer. You can send me a picture on Facebook or on Twitter uh, or on Instagram. I love, love, love getting these pictures from all of you and love the updates. You've been so helpful to me in the past. I got to say when Fluffy was dealing with some of these earaches and some of these challenges, you all came forward and I loved it. And you shared with me your advice on how to get him better. He is better now. I'm so thankful for that and thankful for all of your support and all of your attention. And we love sharing those dog pictures. I'll have to make another post. So go to Facebook and check that out. Anyway, great to have you all here as always. And I will be back tomorrow. I know I promised to have a little more for you on this Venezuela story. I've been gathering a lot of intel, talking to a lot of sources, and we will have that for you this week because it's growing increasingly complex. And as we focus on Ukraine, I would just say, let's not lose sight of what's going on in our backyard. I'm getting reports that there are a lot of Russians right now in Venezuela, more than my sources have seen in decades. The concern is that as we focus so much on Ukraine and we spend all this money in Ukraine, are we running the risk that we are leaving ourselves right here in our hemisphere vulnerable to having a kind of Ukraine type situation right here two and a half hours from Miami? I mean, that that's short-sighted of us if that indeed is the case. And unfortunately, and by the way, Kissinger was quoted this week talking about this lack of leadership in the world. Kissinger's right. The U.S. has not stepped up to the plate as the hegemonic power of the world. It is sort of slacking off, if you would, focusing on one thing while completely ignoring some of the other stuff that's going on out there. Given all that, we are going to be increasingly vulnerable. So I want to talk about that in light of really understanding the complexities of the national security situation that we are living with right here, right here in the Western Hemisphere. It's pretty insane when you look at some of the financial decisions that were made regarding financial markets and how some of the Venezuelan debt could be traded. It's made it very advantageous for the Russians to be able to scoop all this stuff up. And Venezuela is a resource-rich country. We'll get into it some more, but I mean, you're talking in the Orinoco region about oil supplies that really rival Saudi Arabia. Now, you know, hey, maybe this administration just really hates oil so much that it doesn't care. But let's just be realistic. While I'm all for a transfer to green energy, and that may eventually be the path we can be on, let's be realistic about what's happening in the here and now. And in the here and now, we still need oil. So where are we going to get it? Hopefully as much domestically as we can, but also let's be thoughtful about what exists within our hemisphere and why the heck would we be turning it over to the Russians? Anyway, this is what they're doing right now. I want to go into the uh, law of unintended consequences that's going on within the sovereign debt markets right now, which leaves all of this debt available for purchase for pennies on the dollar to the Russians, thereby just saying, here you go, here you go. Hey, we should not be doing that. We should be thinking more clearly, but um, these, these guys aren't rocket scientists. We don't get anybody in politics. It's decently smart these days and has any understanding, frankly, of some of the financial issues, the economic issues that really make this world go round. So I'm frustrated by that. We need to talk about it some more. So I'll see you tomorrow. But in the meantime, do me a favor, go over to my website, trishintel.com. Sign up for my newsletter because you're going to hear all the news that we are watching, my team and I, every single week. Plus, you're going to get special opportunities to speak with me and some of the best experts directly You can be part of these closed conference calls and conversations. I'd love to have you be part of it. All of it's free, by the way, brought to you by the wonderful sponsors of this show, including Legacy Precious Metals. So go to trishintel.com today, sign up for these special opportunities, as well as to get a look at the news and information we here on The Trish Regan Show are watching daily. I'll see you tomorrow.